<clears throat> Thank you. Well, uh, Pastor Phil showed his socks, so I'll show mine. I have, I have grandchildren on my socks, but, you know, they're a result of being a father and going through all of that, you know, all that that means. But, well, happy Father's Day. Today's Father's Day. How exciting is that? One thing we all have in common is we have a father. Some of those relationships for us were, were good relationships or are good relationships, and some of those relationships not so good. You know, I was realizing today, not many people talk about a, a mother wound, but a lot of people have a father wound. And, you know, as a dad, a dad dad's role is very, very important. And <clears throat> one of the things that's really on my heart this morning is that regardless of what our relationship was like or is like with our our, our earthly father, that we can turn to our heavenly father and just know the perfection of what it means to be fathered by him. Just the amazing fullness that that brings. Some of you out there are spiritual fathers. And some of you who had a bad relationship with your earthly father actually have a, a spiritual father in the family of God. And that's a gift. That's amazing. And that happens, and that's happened for me uh, in many ways. But all of us have a heavenly father, and, and hopefully today's message on our father God will be an encouragement to you. I love being a father. I also love and respect my sons, the older two of which have become fathers. And I am incredibly impressed and respect how they are such loving and caring fathers. I think they're saying, Dad, I'm going to call you and raise you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do even better, right? And, and I say, go for it. And I'll cheer you on all the way. You know, it's such a joy to see that. Now, here's a picture of my son Jacob with uh, my newest granddaughter, Phoebe. You know, look at her. Look, at, I love that picture of him doing push-ups. Such a strong sense, and she's just resting into his strength. I love that. She has an amazing smile. Yesterday, I was doing some cotton candy stuff, and my arm was coated with sugar. So I went up to, I went up to Phoebe here, and then I let her lick my arm. I go, Grandpa's sweet, isn't he? You know, so I, it was awesome. I think it worked. Today, she was like so excited to see me, right? I mean, looking at my arm was kind of sweet and salty, but anyway, whatever. <clears throat> uh, uh, but they're celebrating their first Father's Day. How exciting is that? Oh, my goodness. But Father's Day also reminds me of a story that Jake, my son Jake, tells. He tells it much better than me. The guy is so hilarious. I just love listening to him tell funny things, funny stories. But he, he talks about, he goes, you know, when you're a little kid, he goes, your parents have like legend status. I mean, they can do anything. They're big people and they can do all these things and they're strong and all that. He goes, and then you get older, you know, and you're a little, like, a little more at their height and all that. And then you re start realizing, you know, they have a lot of flaws. You know, <laughs> you know they, you kind of, like, it, 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 it kind of that, that legend status kind of dissipates. He goes, and then something happens. You start having your own children. And once you have your own children, you start thinking, how did my parents ever do this? <laughs> he goes, then you, gain, then you regain legend status again. So, so things are looking up for, for me, so I'm excited about that. And, uh, you know, re, re, gain, I'm, the, I'm, on the, I'm ascending here. Uh, looking forward to that. I think that's just a gift of God, right? Gift from God, right? That's good. All right. So uh, today's text, if you... Could please stand with me uh, if you're able to. Let's honor God by reading this amazing text in Ephesians 3, verses 14 through 21. And it says this, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might, through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and breadth and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, 
that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. This is amazing. I think this is two sentences. <laughs> Paul's really good at long sentences. And uh, just, just incredible, so rich. I mean, how can I ever talk about that in one message, right? Right, so I hope you have all afternoon and you scheduled it all out. It's going to be amazing. No, just teasing. We have barbecues probably heating up right now, so I better get going. So the word at, at the beginning of this uh, portion of Scripture says, for this reason. And whenever you have a for this reason, there's a reason for the for this reason. <laughs> if there's a therefore, it's there for a reason. So... For this reason refers back to chapter 3, this same chapter, verse 1, where Paul starts the chapter with, for this reason. And then just like a, like a good dad, right, he got distracted. And uh, at least I can relate to that. And then he goes on talking about all kinds of other stuff. And now he's re, uh, revisiting what he intended to do at the beginning was to pray. So he says, for this reason. Now, if we're looking at the context for this prayer, we have to then go back to the end of chapter 2. So let's do that. Let's go to the end of chapter 2. And it says, having been, now as I read this, I want you to look for and notice all the construction terms. All the construction terms used as I read this. That's a good fatherly thing to do is build things, right? So he says, having been built on the foundations, foundations, uh, foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. We had a prophecy about that today, didn't we? About together. And we are all in this together literally, but the family of God and the church of God has been in this together way before COVID. And uh, it became a popular phrase during COVID, but we are certainly in this together. And I am so grateful for that. There's nothing that replaces being in something over a long period together. It does build you together. And here, Paul is using all this building and construction term language because he's talking about building the church. He's building and, and discussing this idea of building the church. And the big thing going on in Ephesians is that Paul is addressing Jews. He's in, he's in Roman prison. He's talking to the Gentiles and Ephesians, and the Jews there, actually, Jews and Gentiles there. But what he's introducing is this idea is that Jews and Gentiles are equal in the family of God. And Jews, you need to welcome all these Gentiles. They're no longer foreigners. They're no longer strangers, but they're welcome in the family of God. And and basically what Paul's saying is, there's no room for racism in the family of God. Amen. Amen. And so, we're going to be loving and welcoming, and we're going to be built together. We are part of the same family, the same temple, the same uh, house that, that receives the presence of the Lord, the same temple. And this temple imagery is throughout Scripture, really, from beginning to end, and we see it even right here. So he's writing to the Ephesians. Well, guess what? Pastor Phil and I were just in Ephesus. Not really. I just thought about it. It wasn't much more than two months ago, just a little over two months ago in April. We were in Ephesus. And in Paul's time, Ephesus was this vibrant cosmopolitan port city. It was beautiful. And it was developed. And it was way more advanced than we think. We think 2,000 years ago. We think ancient times. But just in these ruins that we show, I'm certainly show you pictures of, hopefully you see just the amazing grandeur of this city. And so here we go. And there's a, there's a shot there. Uh, that's a, the stage of the theater. The, the theater itself houses 20,000 people. And there, that road there, that's a road from the port. They call it the port, uh, the port road or whatever. <laughs> and it's coming up to the theater. So people would, they would come in, they'd drive, uh, 
come up to the port, and often in Roman times, there'd even be chariots to go out and pick you up at like taxis and bring you into the city, and they could go up to the theater and watch some amazing show. 20,000 people could do that. So let's move on quickly. We'll show these. I just want you to see, though, the construction. When he talks about chief cornerstone, they knew what he was talking about. The people receiving this letter knew what it meant to build and to be fit fitted together. So you see all these pillars and stones and things being fitted together. Let's move quickly then. Okay, there we go. This is another street. Let's go next one. Okay, this one is really cool. I just look at that road is the same one Paul walked on. Just amazing. Just incredible. And those steps. And those, see those dark spots in the steps? That's like, uh, like drainage. All right. I'm going to show you some plumbing here in a little bit. Let's move next. Okay, look at that. Okay, that's a shot from a distance. That's the library, that tall thing in the distance. I'll show you a close-up of that in a moment. All right, there it is. Look at that. So that's, this is never really this empty, but when you travel to Turkey and uh, during uh, COVID, that's what it looks like. All right, <laughs> and so we were blessed. Okay, look at that little pipe there in the middle there. I should have my pointer, but there's a pipe there, and that is plumbing. That's drainage. That's like Storm drainage in the city or sewer, sewer drainage. Let's look at the next one. Look at those three pipes going down the way. Isn't that incredible? They had plumbing in ancient times. We don't think of that. And some of this, we saw stacks of this clay pipe that's probably in better condition than our 70-year-old stuff here in Pullman. Amazing. All right, next. Okay, so this actually isn't the theater, the big 20,000-seater. This is just a 1,500-seater. This was like a concert hall, or they would have their city council meetings there, just for 1,500 people. All right, next. That's the theater. So it goes all the way up to the left. You can hardly see that. That's my photography. I could have got a better one online. But anyway, that seat's 20,000. All right, next. All right, and then we, oh, we found some ancient emperors. Here, I think we have a close-up. These were, we found a picture of some ancient emperors of the time. The guy on right, he was the head guy. The other guy was just assisting him. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but they were, I think they were pretenders actually. But anyway, whatever. So, but they were having fun nonetheless. All right, next. We can go next. All right, so th th these mosaics, incredible artwork, phenomenal craftsmanship. Next. And look at this. Okay, that, in the corner there, there's a pipe in a house coming from up above, down below, draining stories of uh, in a house. So they obviously had some kind of plumbing upstairs because they had to flow down. Next. All right. Just, oh, and there's another pipe there in the left. I, it was buried in the wall. Oh, and look at this. Well, guess what that is? Yep. Yep. Nature hasn't changed a whole lot. Uh, <laughs> look at that. You know, just the, just the concept though. I mean, this is actually what the Romans did. They just kind of all went together, probably solved the world's problems and I, I don't know, you know, they, I, I don't even want to really imagine it, so let's move on. <laughs> but seriously, I was like, amazing. Hey, how's it going, George? I mean, well, whatever. Whatever, okay, here we go. So this is a, this is a structure that has houses in it. So these are houses. This is some of, the, some of the frescoes and things like that in the houses. Let's go next. Look at that, some more artwork, the color, the beauty. Next. Look at that. So on the floor there, you see pictures, you know, probably of some Roman ruler. They wanted to ingratiate themselves, you know, whatever, to, and artwork and pillars. And there's a lion there upside down. But anyway, just amazing. Next. Oh, and then this is what, so today Ephesus, it was a port city. But today, these ruins are way inland because the Meander River silted. And so now the port is way further out, miles, several miles away. And it's called Kusadasi today. So this is a picture of the port uh, of the city Kusadasi. So that was when we were there. That was beautiful. Next shot. In other words, this is Kusadasi port today. And it was great. And is that all? I think that might be all. So the idea is Paul's writing using construction language, but the people in Ephesus knew construction. They knew what it meant to be fitted together. So they, Paul knew his audience and he knew what kind of language to reach them. And I think that's also just a great example for us today. So in 314, though, what we see is we find Paul bowing. He's bowing before the Father. And I believe as he's bowing, he is praying according to the Father's will. You can't bow before the Father and not take on the heart of the Father. 
his tone, actually, as we read the letter, is extremely fatherly. And he's, pre- he's praying for these Ephesian believers. So the first point today is bowing in humility before our Father God. Bowing is something we don't do much in our culture. It is significant that Paul is bowing his knees to the Father. It seems like such an intimate detail to include. And there could be many reasons that Paul included this detail. But I believe a simple and a profound truth in Paul bowing is that he's saying, Father God, I am your son. Paul was acknowledging in humility that he's a child of God. And he wanted to communicate that example to the Ephesian believers. He wanted them all in their hearts and spirits to bow down and go, okay, we're all equal here at the feet, foot of our Father. At the feet of our Father God, we're all equal. Jews and Gentiles, everybody in the family of God is equal at the foot of the Father. Amen. You know, when I play with my grandchildren, I get down on my knees. Why do I get down on my knees? Because I want to be at the level of a child. So I believe when Paul's bowing, he's getting at the level of a child. Now when I bow with my, or kneel down on my knees with my grandchildren, then we wrestle and we crawl around and we play and we have so much fun. Did I just say grandchildren? I think I did. And I just so happened to have a few pictures, believe it or not, of my grandchildren. So I showed some of Phoebe. Here's so here's, here's what I happened to be in Boston in March. And do you guys know, how many have heard of the book, Make Way for Ducklings? Right? So this, this uh, picture here is my grandchildren playing with the ducklings that that book is about in the public gardens near Boston Commons in Boston. So there's Nellie and Gus and Noah and, and then there's my son Joshua. How fun. All right, next. Quickly. All right, there we go. <laughs> oh, gosh, they are amazing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wearing my fro, my do. All right. So here's Nellie. She graduated uh, from kindergarten, and I debated on whether to share this, but I am an unashamed, proud grandpa. And so she did get the Academic Excellence for Reading Award. In kindergarten, she's an amazing reader. Thank God she has a mom that is really smart and reads really well. I mean, a mom, and thank God she has a grandma, too, that is like that. So... And her dad, of course, is very much so that way. All right, here we go, next. All right, well, uh, there we go. Okay, uh, a few more. Oh, gosh, I had so much fun with them. These are all from March. All right. So I think that may be, is that it? Oh, yeah, there, oh, there's Phoebe again. <laughs> I love it. How fun to have a grandchild in town, actually. All right, so when Paul bows, though, he's saying, I'm your child. You are my father. In this act, Paul is lowering himself, and what happens is he ends up getting an exalted view of God. So as he lowers himself, he gets an exalted view. Remember, at the end of his prayer, in verse 20, it says, God, this is is what he ends up with as he's praying, as he's bowed down before the Father. He ends up with, God is able, which is the word dunamē. It's that God is powerful, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. When Paul humbles himself, his view of God enlarges. By bowing in childlike humidity, humidity, yeah, it's a little humid, uh, and humility, Paul is acknowledging his limitations. And I was just displaying mine for you. So so Paul Paul is acknowledging his limitations. He was acknowledging his vulnerability. He was acknowledging his dependence before his father. When we bow before our father God in prayer, we're saying, you have the answers. I don't. We're saying, I trust you. And we're saying, you have what I need. You know, I thought about this, and I thought of my mom, actually. My mom shared how when they first got married, and she started having us kids, and probably as soon as, they had the fifth, <laughs> then she's really going, oh my goodness, Lord, how do we ever do this here? And I think she started realizing something. She was raised in a home. She was really the only child between two parents that got together that each had two children. And so, and then her dad never, he was affectionate, but never told her he loved her with words. And then 
Then she started looking at her husband, my dad, and realized, you know, he was an orphan. His dad ran out on the family when he was two. He had no dad. He was raised by his mom. She died at age 10. Raised by grandma. She died at age 13. Then she lived, he lived with his sister, and she was living with a guy while her husband was off to war. So what examples did he have to be a dad? And I could just sense she probably felt this desperation. And what she shared with me and us is that, you know, I, I prayed to God. And I believe this was just a gift to all of us. Because I prayed to God and I offered all of you up to him. And I just said, Lord, they're yours. <laughs> she didn't know what to do with this. So she said, Lord, they're yours. I give them to you. Please take them. And keep them. And guess what? To this day, all five of us love Jesus. All five of us follow him. I believe it's due to humble bowing before a father God and saying, Father God, please father these kids. I need your help. You know, as we bow down and declare our dependence on him, in that place, our revelation of God and what he can do grows. We get, a, we get a revelation of his dynamite power, what, the unlimited nature of what he can do. You know, there, what, one of the things I, I want to talk about this morning is, is how our extraordinary God is involved in our ordinary life, and he wants to make our ordinary, in a way, extraordinary by his very presence involved in it. I got a book called a Theology of the Ordinary. It was a gift from Pastor Daryl Merrill, who spoke to us recently. And, and he and I just love to talk about different things like this. And he gave me this book as a gift with his highlights in it. It was amazing. You know, that's, that's, that's really a treasure. Anyway, so I was reading this. And here's just a couple things that, out of this book. It talks about how as a created being, we're finite. We're limited. We were not created to be God. We were created like him in his image. But limitations are part of our goodness. When God created us, limited as we are, he said, it is very good. With our limitations, it's very good. That was in perfection. We were created with limitations. When he created us with bodies, this introduced the possibility of hunger and thirst and sleep. The limitations that are part of us being not God were intended to keep us close and in relationship with God. Our very limitations imply the need for relationship so that he can be our bread of life, so he can be our living water, addressing our need for food and water, and also so that he can be our rest, addressing our need for sleep. To be a creature is to refuse to make ourselves but instead to joyfully accept our limitations. It's to know that our self-making would be our unmaking. Adam and, Adam and Eve rebelled against the limitations. They gave in to the temptation. They wanted to be God, to be as God, and to know all things as God. And in the process, they lost access to the tree of life and ended up, ended up making their own spiritual death due to their sin. They rebelled against their built-in limitation instead of embracing it. Most marketing in our culture is to convince us to make ourselves. Marketing promises to give us the tools by which to shape ourselves. The last time I read in the Bible, we're the clay and he's the potter. We're not the clay and the potter in one. These marketing advertisements that we see all the time come in our direction oh, umpteen times a day. They're basically lies to sell us what we already have from our Father God. We already have security. We're already loved. We're already adequate in Him. And yet they're promising all those things if you just buy our product. So we got to get the good language of, of uh, when we're watching those things like, well, who says so? You know we got to kind of like rebel against the advertising and, and embrace God Amen. instead of the opposite. Amen. Limitation was written into Adam and Eve's perfection 
because limitation put them in a proper relationship with the creator. Their humanity was not a problem for God. It was their greatest gift. Grasping after the fruit was an attempt to live without limits. It was at root ingratitude at their being made and created as creatures, limited creatures. Being a created human involves doing all kinds of ordinary things in our everyday life. Things like doing dishes. <laughs> got, got, got a little excitement there, yeah. <laughs> Pastor Phil and I both do dishes. Our wives have trained us well after 40 years, so we're, we're doing well. Uh, doing dishes, doing laundry. Not, not that good. Not that good. Well, I might, I, well, I won't. Well, I'm not going to go into that. Okay. Uh, doing dishes, <laughs> doing laundry, cooking, and, and eating. Praise God. And, yeah, he does that well. <laughs> and going to work. And mowing the lawn, oh, he does that well. He mows the lawn for the church here. Going to work, mowing the lawn, paying the mortgage, serving coffee at church. Saw Janet Jewett coming in early today to serve coffee. Thank God for Janet. Yep. And then doing church family chores and just plain being mothers and fathers and being friends and being co-workers in Christ, right? All of these things are intended to be done as a worship to our God Connecting us finite beings in a relationship with our infinite God. Amen. Get this. Jesus lived 30 years of this stuff. We focus on the three years of his ministry because the Bible focuses on that. But there were 30 years. Right. And there's a lot we can infer from the 30 years. And in doing that 30 years as God, living all, all those things in a way, he's redeeming every aspect of ordinary life. Think about it. That's, tough. That's good stuff to meditate on. I won't develop it because <clears throat> we're short of time. But bowing before our Father reminds us that we're a child. And childlikeness and dependence and childlike trust and respect and awe, all of those lead to an, uh, an amazing revelation of who our Father God is. Now, speaking of childlikeness, you'll be glad to know that even though Pastor Phil and I are in our 60s, we still know what it's like to be childlike, and in a way, we were making, uh, we were kind of being childlike in New York City. Here's a couple pictures. So you can see Pastor Phil there. There's a statue, and he's just like posing right like her, right? Isn't that cool? Isn't that amazing? And I was literally grabbing the bull by the horns. And uh, <laughs> anyway, whatever. We were having fun uh, being childlike. All right, there you go. All right, number two. The family resemblance is no accident. In Ephesians uh, 3, 14b to 15, it says, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. There's a deliberate play on words going on here in this Greek sentence. Since the word father is pater and family is patria, all right, related, same uh, roots in the same word where we get the word paternal, um, some translators have rendered the phrase, the father from whom all fatherhood derives its name. Paul is saying not only that the whole Christian family is named from the Father, but that the very notion of fatherhood is derived from the fatherhood of God. To be named in biblical usage, usage refers to the definition of one's identity. This is who I am. I am the child of the I am. Amen. That is who I am, in case you were wondering. <laughs> and that is who you are, in case you were wondering. A huge point Paul makes in this letter to the Ephesians is that Jews and Gentiles are fellow members of the Father God's family on equal footing. And he was correcting something. He was addressing something as Gentiles were being welcomed into the church of God. And they enjoy equal access to the Father. I love this. He actually referring back to chapter 2 here in Ephesians 2.14. It says, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, get this, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. We could use a good dose of breaking down walls of hostility in our culture today. But first, we got to be living it as the church so that the secular world can see how it's supposed to be done. Amen. Now, all of us, can, verse 18, can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit 
because of what Christ has done for us. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. We dwell as one regardless of our ethnicity, our race, our background, our color, whatever. Our, in some countries there's class systems. Regardless of all of that, you are one family. This is so powerful. As believers around the world, from every tribe and nation, we are all family. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is our common DNA. And the fruit of the Holy Spirit is what makes us look alike. You can tell the joy of salvation in a smile anywhere in the world. It's amazing. I have some friends and family or friends from, uh, from Haiti here today. You know, I just love them. And their smile is incredible. And friends from Ghana in Africa. And their smile is amazing. And this, all of it is the joy of salvation. If, you, you know, if there weren't some obvious differences, you'd think we're all from the same family. Amen. Oh, wait, we are. We are. <laughs> well, you know, I, actually, I do. It's Father's Day, right? So the, they're, they're, <laughs> the uh, family resemblance is no accident. Let's take a look at these. Oh, look at that. Eli and Jason, they're looking alike. All right, this next one here. Oh, they're twins. Oh, no, no, that's Liam and Pastor Joe, not his twin brother. Oh, yeah, okay, check that out. Yeah, they're, they're looking alike. Oh, yeah, love it. Oh, my goodness, the family resemblance is no accident. Number three, we're strong. We're strong like our Father God. We have what it takes me had to do ordinary life in an extraordinary way with joy in our heart because our father God indwells us let me let me uh, it says that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory it says in verse 16 to be strengthened with might and that is the word dunamis to be strengthened with dynamite power through his spirit in our inner man. I love this portion of scripture because he's speaking to our inner man. He's speaking to, about how God dwells in our heart. And, and that, that deals with our heart issue. And then later he's going to talk about comprehending. And that's with our mind. And I think all of this is helping us know how to love God with all of our heart and all of our mind. He's infiltrating all of our heart and all of our mind. And I just, oh, I just love him so much. I get... So pumped up about these scriptures. You know, when it talks about we're strong, like our Father God, I, I always think about one story, and I'll try to share it without crying, but it, I was walking to, with my son Jake to school. It was just he and I that day, walking over from our home on Center Street through the trail and then up Kimball, and this was on Kimball, and Jake looks up to me as a seven-year-old boy, and he says, Daddy, am I strong? You see, Jake was born with a heart condition, and he was never able to do sports, never able to do P.E. He was never able to work out. And he goes, Dad, it, it seems like the other boys are strong. Am I strong? You know, and I wasn't, I wasn't an incredible father, but I was certainly aware that that was a powerful question, and I'd better handle that right. And... Uh, you know, as men, we're all asking, am I strong? Dad, do I have what it takes? And this is his answer. You're strengthened with my dunamis power through my spirit in your inner man. You have me. You have what it takes. The answer for seven-year-old Jake and for all of us is, yes, we are strong. Because we are strengthened by the very might of the nature of God himself in us. The Holy Spirit in us doesn't just strengthen us and doesn't just direct us and lead us and guide us. But the fact that the Holy Spirit is in us also gives us our identity. We belong to the creator of all things. To our Father God. We are his children. And get this. He has taken up residence in us. That's a miracle. That word dwell in this scripture, I'm going to point out in a minute here. <laughs> that word dwell, there's two words in Greek for, for dwell. One is to, it's lodging, like you're staying at a hotel and you stay there and you dwell there and you move on. Another is to take up permanent residence. 
And our God takes up permanent residence in our lives. And he's not leaving. He's not leaving. And that's a miracle. Because he loved us while we were yet sinners. It was basically, oh, I want to make my home in them. I'm going to love them to me. I'm going to love them to my death. And then I'm going to like make a way so I can live in them. I love them. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. It's a miracle I'm saved. Oh, well, you don't have to agree that much, Rick. I mean, anyway, no. <laughs> anyway you, do, you do have to agree that much because it's true. Because he lives in us and we're strengthened to do every activity of every day. We're also able then to strengthen and encourage one another with, what, with the strength from wherewith we're strengthened. In community, God's strength is multiplied. We can become bodybuilders in the, in the church of God, in the community of God. But it doesn't work if we try to do it on our own. You know, here's an example of that here in this uh, video, trying to do it on our own here. Samson, look. His hair's growing out. Let's look. The strength. No, nope, ah. just kidding. He ain't moving those. <laughs> the strength of smell. Oh, that's amazing. I'm strong and I'm funny, but looks aren't everything. And I, <laughs> if only your hair was longer. <laughs> if your hair was longer, you can get those over. I could have. I'm so sorry. <laughs> if you watch this tree here. <laughs> it is so fun to hike with CJ. You, know, you never know what's going to show up on video or whatever. Oh, it's a blast. I think I was saying... You know, that I'm funny and strong, but funny, but looks aren't everything, and strong smelling, but, you know, whatever. So, anyway, CJ's, he's just, what a great dad. He and David Ratliff took their daughters camping. Huh? Dads with daughters. Here we go. Yeah, so you've got to ask those girls what it was like. You know, it was great. Anyway, it, I did ask, so it was fun. But I don't have time to get into all that. It was fun, though. It was great. They're amazing, amazing dads. All right, um, all right. So our father, point four. Our father's love makes all the difference. One memory I have of my dad, I have many, but one is that often when we were driving together in the car, he would reach over and he would grab my hand. And just as a, a young boy and as a teen, uh, that fatherly affection was incredibly meaningful, and it still is. You know the. There's something about fatherly affection for all you dads out there. <laughs> the word love is used about 20 times in these six chapters of Ephesians. It says the, that Christ may dwell, in verse 17 here, that Christ may dwell, take up permanent residence in your hearts through faith. You know, they say 95% of being a father is showing up. Uh, and, and so God is saying, I'm taking up permanent residence. So he's, he's nailing that one. I love it. But also I love the fact that by, by that example, he's basically saying I could show up at my children's doorstep later in life and say, I'm taking up permanent residence. You're going to be taking care of me for a while. But anyway, no, just that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Rooted is a botanical, botanical term like roots that are feeding the tree. And the root is love, and grounded is the foundation with which your whole life is built on, and that is love. We're rooted and grounded in love permanently, and that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints, that's all of us together, what is, and I think it will take all of us together to even attempt to comprehend this, <laughs> what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Basically, Paul is saying here, to know... To know the love of Christ that is unknowable. So he's del being deliberately paradoxical, using irony. And he's probably saying, go figure that one out. Think about that for a while. Like maybe for eternity, maybe. How, <laughs> however much you come to know your father God's love, there is always more to know. It is un inexhaustible. That fact, that fact keeps drawing me into him. He intrigues me so much. I love to discover uh, things about him that are new. I love to discover how much he loves me. You know what? And his love is extremely patient when it comes to my experience with him. <clears throat> There's always more to know about God and his love. Now, as God's family, we're all brothers and sisters who love our father and love each other, right? 
Now that can be challenging sometimes. So let's just like declare, declare this in faith. Now turn to some, your brother or sister you're sitting next to and say uh, that you love them. Just say, I love you, right? Okay, all right, okay, there you go, all right? All right. I think there's a guy over here that said, she said she loved me. All right, anyway, anyway. But loving each other. Now this is where we need the power of the Spirit's might and Christ's indwelling to enable us to love each other. Any of you that have been married for a while know the truth of that. Right? I pray that my wife gets a good dose of that every day. Because we're all different. And so to love each other is kind of tough. You know, Christians are blessed with each other and they're stuck with each other. <laughs> Snoopy, Charlie Brown's dog in the comic strip Peanuts, he, he says it pretty well. He says, I love humanity. It's people I can't stand. You know, <laughs> I love that. You know, our lives in so many ways depend on the community of the family of God and all of its messiness. You know, the love of Christ is broad enough to encompass all mankind. It's long enough to last for eternity. It's deep enough to reach the most degraded sinner. And it's high enough to exalt him to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Now, in the cross, we can know the length that God will go to, uh, as we see the depth of his love, as the cross was buried in the earth, the height of it points to heaven, and the width of it, as we see his arms stretched out, saying, I love you. This is for you. Thank you, Lord, for dying for us. Number five, our father's stuff is our stuff. I got a call from one of my sons this morning about borrowing a truck, right? So our father's stuff is our stuff. <clears throat> Ephesians 3.19 says that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I love that. The fullness of God. Paul's prayer is that we would know that we're filled to overflowing with the presence, love, power, and riches of God. The fullness of God. The indwelling presence of God is a sheer and an utter gift to us. Here it is, he says. I'm indwelling you. Be filled with my fullness. It's not a reward for having done it all right. It's a free gift. This is sheer grace. It's an unimaginable possibility, and it's life-giving hope to us every moment of every day. This is our inheritance as adopted sons. You have the fullness of God. Our Father's stuff is our stuff. He lives in us, and he, he wants us to have everything that he has. It's, because he lives in us, it's not me casa is your casa. It's me is his casa. God makes his home in us. Individually and corporately, we are the temple of God. Ephesians 1.5 says, Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. He adopted us. Oh, this wasn't a begrudging thing. This was the good pleasure of his will. We have become sons and daughters of God. You know, this makes me think of an amazing family in our church. They're watching online today. But, you know, we've all, we've all known Isaac and Monica, right? And they're amazing parents. They have two biological children and four adopted children. And we look at them. I look to them as heroes. They're amazing. I love them. And I love their example of the father heart of God and the mother heart of God. It's amazing. But every time you encourage Isaac he goes about that, he goes, well, my dad, he's my hero. He's my, the real example. So if, if you've never met Ralph, right, Isaac's dad, Ralph has become a, just a real special friend, and I just love him. And I love his example. I love how he exudes the heart of the Father God. They have three biological children and 13 adopted children, many with special needs. Incredible, incredible man. And incredible children. They were at Kids and Rigs yesterday. Oh, I loved interacting with them. They were just great. If you've, anyway, they're all amazing, and it would be great to get to know them. But in Romans 8, 17, it says, Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, or go through COVID, in order that we may also share in his glory. 
This is mind-blowing stuff. And it's worthy of meditation, of thinking about. It's actually worthy of a message series. <laughs> our Father's stuff is our stuff. Thank you, Lord, for that, for your generosity. Thank you, Lord, for examples like Ralph and Judy and Isaac and Monica and the Crosses and the Baldridges and amazing people. And then uh, point six is, but wait, there's more. But we won't take a lot of time talking about the more. We'll just refer to it. It says, our Father God gives us more than we can imagine. It says, now to him, Paul's bowed down. He's getting this revelation. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, this dunamis power is working in and through us. To him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. As I prayed with my dad, this man that was on his deathbed, my dad, who was an orphan at age 10, had no dad since age 2, didn't know his dad dad I met him later in life but as I prayed with my dad on his deathbed a month before he died he did not feel real forgivable I shared the gospel with him it was just an amazing privilege an opportunity and like kind of a pinnacle of life right to be able to share the gospel with your dad and he said Tom I have done so many bad things. I felt like at that time, it was like a little child. It was this orphan boy talking. I've done so many bad things. I've been a bad little boy. How could I ever be forgiven? I said, Dad, that's what the blood of Jesus is for. It takes care of all of that. And he cried. And I cried. And he gave his life to Jesus. And he's with my mom in heaven. I've shared this story before, but on Father's Day, what an amazing gift. Salvation. He's in heaven with my mom. How does God want to meet you right now? What is it that he is exceedingly, that he wants to do that's exceedingly abundantly above what you could ask or think? My dad didn't feel forgivable. But God was just waiting to pour out forgiveness. <laughs> that was above what he was thinking. You have a good, good father who wants to pour out unlimited love, unlimited strength and power and blessing on you. He wants to forgive you where you feel unforgivable. He wants to love you where you feel unlovable. And he wants to strengthen you where you feel permanently weak. In your heart right now, you can simply take those things, bring those things to your Father God. Right now, we can just do that right now. Just bring those things to your Father God and let your loving Father pour out to you on Father's Day here. Just let him pour out to you. Just let him pour out right now. Father, minister right now. Father God, we, we bow in our hearts and we, we bow down and we ask you, just pour out your abundance. Pour out your incomprehensible, incomprehensible love. Pour out your forgiveness. Resolve bitterness right now, Lord. Help people to forgive and to let go of things that have been a bondage. Supernaturally intervene right now, Father God. Have your way. We love you. We love you. And since we know dads love like kisses, make your dad glad, give him lots of kisses. We do kiss you, Lord, right now. Oh, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Enjoy Father's Day. Especially just enjoy our Father God. Amen. God bless you all.